This podcast contains potentially sensitive topics, drug use, and strong language. Listener discretion is advised. Kuchu, you talk about going through some ups and downs emotionally. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about like what music does for you during those times? Like, like if you're super, if you're up or if you're down, like, do you turn to music in those moments? There's a song out there that seems like it speaks to every emotion and every mood that you might be in. There's some type of song that fits it. And for me, like I've got all kinds of different playlists on my phone, and, uh, and it's all, it all just fits the, the mood or the, the state of mind I might be in. And so, yeah, there's music that can lift me up, and there's music that I might be down and out, but, you know, it speaks to my situation and it kind of calms me through it. Mary Mac, dressed in black, silver buttons on down her back. Hello, gypsy toe, she broke a needle and she can't so walk in the dog. Just a walk in the dog. Well, if you don't know how to do it, I'll show you how to walk the dog. Ask my mama for 15 cents. I'm Rex Holbein, and welcome to You Know Me Now, a podcast conversation that strives to amplify the unheard voices in our community. In these episodes, I want to remind our listeners that the folks who share here do so with a great deal of vulnerability and courage. They share a common hope that by giving us a window into their world, they're opening an increased level of awareness, understanding, and perhaps most importantly, a connection within our own community. Personal relationships can be thought of as the foundational supports of a healthy community. By simply getting to know each other, being exposed to different life experiences and views, we broaden ourselves and deepen our ability to empathize within the community. While we know this to be true, society appears to be increasingly slipping into polarized camps. We find ourselves in echo chambers, ones where there is little room for opposing views. This is happening at all political levels and around nearly every important issue. And while echo chambers are a form of immediate gratification, which is of course an instant feel-good, they are an unhealthy environment for all of us. The good news is we can easily do something about this. Starting today, right now, we can work to be more open with each other, to courageously be willing to hear and respect different views, lifestyles, beliefs, and choices, especially from people outside our circle. It begins when we just say hello. And with that, 
I'm honored to have this discussion with Preacher. Because uh, I come from a family of musicians and, and artists, I'm the next generation, so here I am, I gotta keep the tradition alive. I first started playing music uh, with my grandfather. I don't know what his idea was, if it was to start a family blues band or what, but he bought a couple guitars and a bass and he had this guy, can't remember what his name is now off the top of my head, but he'd come by the house once or twice a week to show us the basic rhythms of blues and stuff like that. And it was like, I took one lesson and that was it. You know, and off I went. And the next thing you know, here I am. I guess one of the first ones I learned was uh, Got My Mojo Working by Muddy Waters. part of my life. It started from when I was just a little baby, really. Cause music has always been there. It's been a part of my life. As far as me playing it and becoming a, more of a, more than a listener and more of an enjoyer of the music, that happened later on in life when I was able to really understand the lyrics and stuff like that. When I was younger, there were certain things that I didn't under, really understand about the music. You know, there's what they call the double entendre. What's being said isn't really being said. You know, there's certain blues songs that my, grand, my grandfather and, and a lot of my family, they'd get tickled because I, I knew the words to them, but, and they knew that I didn't know what they were really talking about. So, and I got shut up a couple of times, you know, don't, don't, don't sing that song, you know. <laughs> People are hearing something else. Exactly. And, uh, you know, so that's, it just kind of blossomed from there. And then as I grew older, I, I finally picked up an instrument. The first instrument I played was bass guitar. That was the first instrument I ever played. And I uh, played that for a while, and then when I decided I was going to start playing, playing out on the streets and playing in shows and stuff like that, that's when I said, I've got to do something that fills the void a little bit more than just playing the bass. And I picked up the guitar, and I started playing that, you know, without any lessons, really. I, I just figured, okay, notes turn into chords, and so I'm about to put these three notes together, and that makes a chord. Let me find the three notes on the guitar where they're close together, and boom, I got my chord. And then, one, and then here I am just playing and singing, you know, the blues and gospel or what have you. Guess what got me motivated more into playing music was when my late pastor's wife, she told my mom to uh, have me bring my bass to, to choir rehearsal one night. And ever since then, you know, I've been at it playing music, just out there doing, doing my thing. Did you know already at that time that you had a beautiful voice? No, I didn't think I could sing at all, you know. How did you discover your voice? Just by watching people and then their enjoyment of it, not turning a frown or turning away from me and like, oh yeah, I'm not listening to this. This sounds like two cats going at it. I'm not listening, you know. That's one thing that made me realize that my voice was, was all right. I love you, Tip. I love you, top. I love you, baby, like a hog left song. You're my big leg woman. Short, short, pretty straight, yeah. Trust me, little darling, that you would never treat me like that. Like a 
Georgia vine Run around the stump I love you baby I'll call you sugar lump Cause you're my sweet little baby Sure, sure, sure Can you stretch it? Just because me little darling Never treat me like her Stuff like that, or uh, might might slow it down a little bit, and might play this other song. When I got when I got sick, I had a terminal brain injury, a brain illness, and doctor said I wasn't supposed to be living this long. I should have been gone back in 2019, 2020, but I'm still here. But when that first diagnosis first came down. I was listening to a song by Howlin' Wolf. I, I think I don't think it's the original writer of it, but that's, that's the version I heard. It's called "Going Down Slow," and it was and it was the same thing. And he was talking about the same thing because he, he felt like because he knew that he was dying. He had, he had a kidney disease, and so he knew he was dying. And he and he sang a song called "Going Down Slow." Uh, <laughs> If I never get well no more Well I had my fun If I never get well no more Well my health is failing on me Lord you know I'm going down slow Well, please write my mother, tell her the shape I'm in. Why don't you please, please, please write my mother? Oh, Lord, tell her the shape I'm in. Tell her to pray, pray for me. Lord, and forgive me for all of my sins. And I kind of related to that song because I felt like I was going down slow because it was uh, that illness was killing me slowly. You know, at least I felt it was. But I should have known better because there's a man upstairs who had a, who had a greater plan for me, and that's the reason why I'm here. And I and I thank God that He's kept me here because there's been many. Because I wasn't I wasn't ready to go because there's things that I had to do. Because even at, at that time I was stuck in my drug addiction, and so that's the other thing that I felt like that was killing me. Well, I knew it was killing me. You know, even the long run, it would have killed me if I'd, if I'd have stayed in it. Just of all the craziness that I had went through and I had done and the, the stupidity of it all, you know. So it's just like, here I am, and I'm grateful for it. When I first met Preacher, he was living in a tent with his partner along the Ship Canal in the Fremont neighborhood. He had just been released from jail several hours earlier, and his smile was still a mile wide because of it. Being invited into their tent, one of the first things I noticed was how meticulously organized and beautiful everything was, including the tapestries and little battery-operated string lights hanging from the ceiling. It was not at all what I expected. While sitting there, taking in how they had made this tent a home, Preacher picked up his guitar and began singing a song he had written while in jail. It stopped me with how beautiful his voice was. I remember having a moment of really looking at him closer as a gay black man just out of jail, living homeless with nothing. I couldn't imagine how he had been able to move through so many barriers. Peter, high school is a tough time for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I know like for me, soccer got me through it. Like I could just block everything out and I could just focus on soccer and then the rest of the craziness didn't seem to touch me. Can you tell a little bit about your high school years? Like, like was music a part of that? Do you can you can you share uh, 
you know, your feelings from that time? Well, music, it, it really wasn't, a, uh, as far as me playing goes, wasn't really a big thing for me in high school. I was more of a listener to music at that time. You know, during high school years, I just kind of, I guess you can say I kind of took a brief hiatus <laughs> from it all. Um, outside of outside of church, you know, church was my main thing. I was mainly playing bass while I was in church, but as far as being on the being out and playing in clubs and stuff like that, that didn't come along until after long after high school, really. But um, the music that I would listen to definitely helped me through high school through those tough times. Um, there's not really too much I can remember about high school. To be honest with you, about it. everything is kind of a blur. And uh, cause it seemed like it happened so quick. I know, and also during that time is when I had a, when I was in a car, when I was in two car wrecks, exactly three or six months apart from each other, and I had a brain contusion which messed with my short term memory. You know, that was the first thing that messed with my short term memory, and it also I had to learn her and how to walk and everything was like that during that time frame. And um, so that was a that was a tough goal for me because I couldn't go to a regular high school because I couldn't focus having six periods you know a day, and I couldn't because I couldn't really move around from classroom to classroom. So music got you through high school in a bit, but more as a listener, and it sounds like maybe beginning kind of foundational stuff for you right. later on. And and when did, like, how old were you, and can you remember that moment when when you really kind of looked around and said, "Huh, I'm I'm really gonna I'm I'm really gonna just make a run at it with music. That's gonna be my thing." Did that was there a moment, or did that just slowly evolve for you? It just kind of slowly evolved, but I was in my early twenties. Because it was, matter of fact, I was had to be, be a week before my birth, my 21st birthday. I went to the Blue Moon Tavern on an open mic night, kind of snuck off up in there. You know, nobody asked me, my age didn't card me or nothing. And I went and I had my suit and tie on and everything was like that in the dive bar. But that's what the blues musicians did, you know. You look good for what you do. And so nobody questioned me. And for about, and then I went in the next week, and no, no problems. I played there for almost a month before anybody finally asked me for my ID or anything like that. It's a different bouncer at the door. He finally asked me for my ID on a Wednesday night. That's when I had to open mics. And I met a lot of, a lot of good people through there who helped, helped, helped me blossom and carried me and showed me a lot of different, different angles and, and, and how to handle things on the road, so to speak. Yeah. Well, you joined a long line of musicians that kind of walked through the Blue Moon as part of their journey. Yeah. That's a, that's a classic spot in Seattle. Yeah. And how long did you play at the Blue Moon? Uh, I was about there two or three years, something like that. And then I branched off from there and just started doing my own thing. Um, I played at the uh, I played at the uh, Highway 99 Blues Club. I played there once or twice. Uh, the Triple Door a few couple times, just on a small stage. Uh, the New Orleans Creole Cafe, the Central Saloon, the J and M, the Yin War Tavern over in West Seattle, uh, the Lummy Island Blues Festival, uh, the Bite of Seattle. That's about all I can remember right now. That's a lot. But I'm pretty sure <laughs> the list goes a little bit longer than that. You got around. Oh yeah, I, I played. I even played over in Leavenworth for their for their blues festival they had over there, you know. So yeah, it definitely was been a fun time. And that that involved the same band, the same group, or were you solo, or what? What did that look like during? And that? in the early years, it was just it's just a duo, duo. Me and my good friend uh, Sleepy Joe Rodriguez. He's a harmonica player. So it was just two of us for years. And then then um, he uh, he discovered my father in blues. That's what I call him, Eric Freeman. He took me under his wing and showed me a lot of different things, and because um, he's played all around the world. Um, John John Jackson, which is a Piedmont blues professional, Piedmont blues player, um, taught him how to play. So he so he showed me a few things, and um, so and then we kind of slowly started putting this piece in this band together between the three of us. And know. what were you thinking during that time? Like the sky's I'm, the limit. I'm there. The sky's the limit. I'm, yeah, I'm going on up. Right. That was that was that was that was the plan. And then, uh, I don't know what if it was just they were mad because I was the youngest one in the band and was the band leader or what, but there was a whole lot of, uh, of uh, um, I don't know what the word is, I, I don't want to say sabotage because it wasn't really any sabotage going on, but it was just like a whole lot of things that weren't, to my liking, that were happening. Well, the, the starting of the fall was when the movie was over in eastern Washington and we was getting ready to play, I think we was getting ready to play at Wally's House, yeah, it was Wally's House of Booze that night, and it was hot. And I told, I told everybody, I said, okay, I want you to wear your slacks and your button downs, you know. And so, and so a couple of people, they was, I'm not, it's too hot to wear that, and da 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 da, and those type of things. And it upset me. But my father in blues just said, let them talk. Just let them, just leave it alone, let them be. And um, so him and I, we showed up in three piece suits that night. 
<laughs> Y'all want to see us hot? Okay, we're going to show you how, how we really do it, you know. And uh, my harmonica player and my bass player, they both showed up in shorts and in tank tops. That upset me so bad. We was up in the green room, and I don't know. And so my dad, he told me to go down. He said, just go downstairs and have your drink. And he said, I'll, I'll handle it. When they came downstairs, they were, they were in uniform. So I don't know what he said to them to this day. I don't know what he said to them, but they were in uniform. So, but, but that whole... They got in line. They got in line, but that whole... Um, confrontation there was kind of the beginning of the end and um, so and then one of the band members he wound up going to jail and uh, so that that broke off broke us off for a while and we're still trying to carry on but it just wasn't the same so and then after that breakup what how did you handle it what did you end up doing um I tried to do my solo thing but it just wasn't the same for me and then I got hooked up in a bad relationship yeah, it was a bad relationship because it led me down to to roll roll hardcore drugs and stuff like that, and I kind of put my music not not kind of I did put my music on hold because I was just so wrapped up in that, and um, but but after a while I guess when things got tough and I'm like okay I need to make some money, I, what I had to go back to went to back back to playing my guitar busking on the streets and that's how I supported myself for I don't know three four maybe five years something like that on the streets, you know. This is prior to being homeless. This is this this is when I came homeless. When you became homeless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of the relationship I was in, that's the reason why I became homeless. And it was a it was a choice, because my grand my grandparents and my fam, my my family told me to choose him or me or him him or us, and and I wasn't just gonna leave him out in the, to the wolves because he had no place to go. So I wasn't just gonna throw him out in the world to the wolves, knowing he had never been out there before and didn't know anything. So and I didn't know much, but I at least had a, had an inkling of what was happening. So. And where would you bus? I'm curious. Like, um, we you... we would play. I played downtown Seattle, just all over the place. Um, and then once I left downtown, I wanted to move to North Bend. Well, I had a car at the time, so we were sleeping in my car. And uh, so we so we so we just play. I played wherever I could could find me a spot. Really, um, I um, we was gonna try and detox and get clean. So we went to Eastern, went to Wenatchee, to a buddy of mine's house over there. But that didn't work out. We both couldn't tough it out. And uh, so I was driving back, and that's where I ran into, I slid into the side of a semi-truck and peeled the side of my car like a tin can. And uh, so that was the end of my car, and so it was, so it was on foot then, basically. And, uh, and so we was just tootled around Seattle. Capitol Hill, really, was my main spot. You sleep right in front of Seattle Academy, uh, right underneath the little overhang up there. Just, and, and just a few things in your guitar? Just a few things in my guitar. Tell me, uh, tell me a bit about busking, would you? Like, 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 what is that experience like? It's it's pretty fun because you get to interact with the people, you know, and you and you and you see and you sit and you be able to people watch too. You see all kind of strange things, strange happenings going on, you know, especially especially in the downtown area. Yeah, because you're staying in one spot, and right? So the world's walking by you, right? Uh, and and what about? What about uh, the interactions? I mean, I'm sure you're a very likable human being. Yeah. Did did you have predominantly good interactions, or were people also uh, difficult? I've had predominantly good interactions, but there's some difficult folks as well. You know, um, a lot of hecklers. I'm a I'm musician and an entertainer, so I could be playing a song, and I noticed somebody might be dancing in the crowd or something like that, so I'd jump up from behind my guitar case and go dance with them and stuff like that, you know. That's awesome. Did was it profitable? I mean, you spent a day busking. What would you come away with? Some days were profitable. Others, others were just barely scraping by. Some days, some days I make at least twenty dollars, something like that. And other days I might make a couple hundred dollars. It just all depends on the time of the week and the weather. Yes, Lord, my, 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 
by tomorrow. I'm laughing and I'm clowning. You know I'm just trying to keep from crying, trying to hide the fact I, I've got a worried mind, but I know the sun is shining again. It can keep raining. Only this poke broke down and man that's sitting here in sorrow. Open and I'm praying for mine. Yes, Lord, mine, mine, my tomorrow. Life can always be. You know the sunshine rain you see. It doesn't matter if you're searching high or you're low. We've all got to go through this thing called life. Full of misery, yes it is, and all full of a strife while sitting here in sorrow, hoping and a praying for oh, my, yes Lord, my, my, my tomorrow. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful. Does that bring back memory? Yeah, because you know, that song was written... You know, like the first verse says, people walk on by at the high fluting ways. A lot of folks, they walk by me, but they seem like they had a nose in the air, like they, they look, act like they're better than me, just because I might have been homeless and they, they, they might have had a place to go. You know, even some homeless folks looked at me like sideways because, you know, the way I dressed, my mannerisms, everything's like that. I never let, really, never really let any of that go. I never let the streets consume me like it had some other people. Because some folks, they... They, they get out there and they feel like, okay, all is lost, so I'm just going to lose it all. Whereas somewhere in, in my unconscious, conscious mind, I knew that there was still something there for me. Even though I thought I had lost it all, when in reality I hadn't lost anything at all. It was just a matter, I had just lost my, my way for a little bit. But, I, but, there, but, I, but some type of way, I just knew I was going to get back. I didn't know it for sure, but I just knew it, you know. And then the song goes on talking about laughing in the crown and just keep from crying. That's what I would do, is I would just make jokes and try to keep myself upbeat a lot of times, just to keep from crying, because I was just so heartbroken and looking back and seeing how bad I hurt my family. And I didn't know how to make amends and get back to them. And when it was simple, it was simple, it was simple, simple thing to do was just give up, give up the streets, basically, you know, and turn my life back to what it was, and but at a, on a greater scheme of things. And so, and, and that, and realizing that, you know, I mean, realized that, uh, I realized that, that even though I was going through what I was going through, things is going to get better. You know, life can't always be sunshine and rainbows, as you see. That, that's it's just like it says, everything can't be all happy and rosy and sweet. There's going to be some down times, but there's going to be some sunshine after the rain. And we have to have some rain in our lives to appreciate that sunshine. Whether it's whether it's you're going through a hard time in life, or you or, or 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 you might lose a loved one, or something like that, you know, to realize that okay, they're gone, but what, but what they was, but they, what they have instilled in me, or what they have taught me, is just going to make that sunshine that much more brighter. Do you think uh, that that path that you ended up taking, going into drugs, becoming homeless, do you think that was, you know, in hindsight, that was an important part of your journey? Yeah. Like. like uh, I don't want to say it was meant to be, but it but it certainly right. informed who you are today. Right. Yeah, it definitely did. Because one thing I learned is that you have to go through you have to go through to get through to understand through, and through is that is that just that terrible time in your life. You have to go through some things in order to understand the, understand those things in order to get over those things. How do you write these songs? Like you you you're talking about them coming from street experience, right? Your life experience, but does it come in a moment, or do you do you have a part of it and then you and you piece it together over time? What what's the process for you? Both. Some, sometimes I can sit down and just write the whole song out. It's just falling like rain from the sky. And other times it, it takes some time for it to to really develop. You know, I might write a verse today, and then three months later I might put another verse to it. You know, I might come up with a title, and that's all it is for a couple of years, and then I then I write the song. What What do you want people to know, uh, listening to your songs? Like what? Like it feels being that these are from experiences, they're messages too, right, to right. people. What like, are you are you purposefully 
Here's the right way to ask it. Are you, are you writing them to get them out of yourself and, and as part of your process or is it intentional too for people to know things that they should know about, about life from your perspective? Probably a little of both. And I say that because it's hard for you to really understand what people are going through. or with, with, Sometimes it's hard to understand what you're going through because you don't, because you don't know exactly. It's your, it's your first, it's your first uh, uh, experience with it. So you don't know what's really going on. You don't know how to deal with it. And what I've learned is if you hear from somebody else who's gone through similar or the same experiences, then you might learn a little bit something from that. And you're able to say, okay, this is how I can overcome the situation. This is how, how, how I can stay away from the situation. What would be your message to people that are, that are on the edge of homelessness or struggling through it? What, what would you say to them based on the fact that you've gone through it and you've come back out of it and, and you're an artist, you have a message that you're sharing? What? Just remember that even though you feel like all is lost, all isn't lost, there's somebody there who loves you, cares for you. And that's what I feel like a lot of this is, it boils down to, is that a lot of folks just don't feel loved anymore. They feel like all is lost, their family's thrown up both hands and walked away from them. But if you look at the, look, look at the situation and see what, what you have done, then you might be able to see that if I change this, then okay, this, things can get better. Have you been writing since you're back, in, you're in, back inside now? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, I've been writing. And also, I, and the, at, during my homelessness, I had a lot more downtime, too. I think that's the reason why I was writing so much as well. But now that I'm back indoors, I, you know, I've got my job now and everything was like that. So, so, so finding time to write and rest is, is, is a balance. That's kind of a hard thing to do. Yeah, it's a juggle. It's a juggle. Tell me, you've gone through homelessness, you became a songwriter through it. Um, maybe maybe it's, that period has given you more purpose with regards to your music. Where, where are you now? Uh, in the process of putting a band together, trying to get back out there on, on the road, so to speak, and just doing it to it like I used to, you know, just having a good old time. You know, but uh, and, uh, with, with, a, with a lot more knowledge of, of how to deal with certain situations. I know the journey was a painful one. I want to come back a little bit because you've shared this before, but when you did fall into drugs and ultimately homelessness, it was tough on your mom. Yeah, it was definitely tough on my mom. Yeah. Me and my mom, we were, we're, we're still real tight, but, we, but our connection had disconnected there for a little while. And uh, because, of, because, of, because of my drug addiction and stuff like that, I mean, it got so bad until she said to me, she said, I love you, but I'm going to have to let you go. And that was a hard thing for me. You know, with, cause just for my mother to say that to me. Yeah. After we had, we were so close. You know, I could, I don't care what it was. You know, if it was, as long as it wasn't nothing illegal. If I called her and asked her about it or for it, she, she'd do her best to, to fill, fill my need. I know family is really important to you. Oh yeah. And and, uh, you know, that must have been a tough time for both of you then mm -hmm. to to go through that. How is she now? Oh, she, she, she's ecstatic. She, she's, she's a happy camper. Yeah, and you, you guys talk all the time? Yeah, we talk, we talk all the time. We talk at least a couple of times a week. Yeah. Yeah. This is one song that kept, that it's always kept me going, Precious Lord. And it's done this because it's like a trusting child, we can each can look up with eyes of faith and clasp the hands of our Heavenly Father. He says in Isaiah 41, 13, Fear not, I will help you. I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. There you'll find tender compassion, consolation, love, wonderful peace, a friend to the end, and you can find all this and more in the outstretched hands of the Lord. You know, so when life looks like it's got the best of me and things get rough, you know, I just kind of look up and I just play this song right here. Precious Lord, take my hand. Through the storm. 
stone through the night, precious lowly, lead me to the light, take my hand, precious Precious Lord, please, won't you linger near when my life is, says my life is almost gone. Lest I fall, take my hand, precious Lord, and lead, please lead me home. When the darkness appears, precious Lord, please draw near. And the day, I said the day, past and gone, is long, long, long gone. At the river, you know I stand, got my feet, hold my trembling little hand, precious Lord. Take my hand and lead, just lead me home. Precious Lord, take my hand and lead, just lead me home. thought and I don't know how to ask the question but like uh, it's a reoccurring thing when I'm with you that always um, it comes up in different forms but it, it goes something like this that like I'm I'm just I'm just amazed by your talent and and that calm beautiful way that you go through life with and yet you're this guy for years was also living in a tent along the railroad tracks or the canal mm-hmm. homeless and and it makes me wonder like about how many lives are being missed like you know people it's the name of this show right like you know me now like how many people are not known and are yet unbelievably beautiful people um i guess i guess one question would be you know did you experience that on the street did you were you were you also amazed by the caliber of, of just uniqueness of person that you were meeting yeah there's there's some people that this, that kind of shocked me. Um, there was one guy, I can't remember his name now, up on Capitol Hill, and he used to mumble and talk to himself all the time. And folks would laugh, about, laugh at him and stuff like that. And, and I kind of would, I kind of would too sometimes. Cause I, cause I found what he was talking about was funny to me, you know. But, but there was one day I, had, I caught him when he was by himself, and we started talking, and I come to find out that he had a doctorate, at, you know, and he was, he was some, some bigwig or something like that. And I guess he just, he just got on drugs, and it just fried his brain. You know, but yet he was still had that intellectual process about him, the way he would deal with things, he would talk, the way he would talk and stuff. But it would just sound like a ramble or a bunch of just junk to, if you weren't really paying attention to him. But if you really sat down and listened to what he was saying, he was really saying something. Yeah, I, I think that's I, th- I think that's available for every person. I mean, no, not everybody's gonna have their PhD. Right. But I, th- I do think that's part of humanity, right? Like we all have our story, we all have our worth. Right. So why is it so important that we hear each other's stories? About a year ago, I got to know a young woman by the name of Arcadia. She was 19 years old, living in a tent in Woodland Park, and really struggling. After hanging out with her a number of times, 
She shared this beautiful insight. She said, Each person is born with a tiny slice of the giant map of humanity. And all we know is this piece of the map. But when we meet someone and get to know them, you get to see their slice of the map too. The more people you meet in life, the more areas of the map you learn about. And because of it, the greater your understanding is of humanity and ultimately of yourself. What does God mean to you? Oh, why, is, why is God so important to you? He's the one that, that gives me my health and strength. The one that he's also my motivation, you know, because I want to make it to home, make it want to make it to heaven to see him one of these days, you know. Because um, I know if it wasn't for God, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have this talent. I wouldn't have made it out of my drug addiction. I wouldn't have made out of homelessness. You know, here's here's a big part of that. This is one called changes. It's talking about my experience from that caused me to give up the streets and change my life around. I had a I had a dream one night that I went to heaven. And St. Peter was at the gate and he didn't look too happy to see me. But he just kinda of pointed inside. When I walked through the pearly gates it began to start to rain. And that was a, a strange thing for me because they always talk about heaven was this happy and joyous place and the sun was shining all the time. But it, it was raining. And I walked down as I was walking down the streets, and I came upon this partially built mansion, you know, and that was a stack of lumber in the yard, and it's another this big old stack of twigs in the yard, and everybody was gathered around you know, around the front porch and looking at somebody sitting on the front porch, you know, like somebody was talking to them, and they couldn't, and I couldn't see who it was at first, but it was just like the Red Sea part went this, this sort of the crowd. And I, and I seen it was Jesus sitting there, and he had the Lamb Book of Life open. And he looks at me, and he says, come here, my child. I go up, and I go to talk to him, and he stops me before I can say anything. And he, he, be, and he, began, to, he began to cry, you see. And that, and that kind of definitely was another strange thing to me that made me say, okay, what was going on? And I haven't looked down, he had the Lamb's Book of Life, and he had opened, opened my chapter, and he said, this is where you were, this is where you are, and this is where I told you to be. And I'm tired of going through changes with you. And that's how I wrote it, and that's when I wrote this song. He said, look where you are, it's not where you should be. You should be playing your guitar and preaching about me. I'm tired of going through changes with you. Says I'm tired of going through changes with you. If he had to talk with me, I know he had it with you. I don't know what we said, but I know you know what to do. He's tired of going through changes with you. I said he's tired of going through changes. Well, it's gonna rain, it's gonna rain It won't be water, but by next time God showed Noah, the rainbow sign It won't be water, but by next time He said it's time to go into changes with you He said it's time to go into changes And after that conversation, which further cemented that for me was a few nights later, I had another dream that me, God, and the devil were all sitting around a conference table and we had a meeting. And God looks at me and says, I had, I had OD'd the night before. And he says to me, he says, if you do this again, talking about if I OD again and die, he says, I'm, he says, I'm, he says, I'm, gonna send you, I'm sending you to hell. And, I'm, and when I woke up, that made me change my life around. God is throwing his hands up with me. That means everybody else is, throwing, is definitely throwing hands up with me, so I have to make a change. And that's when I made that change. God is a central part of preacher's strength and a defining force in his life path. So is his family. Why is family so important to you? Because they're my rock. 
they're, they're, they're the ones that help help me keep going, because it gives me something to look forward to, something to to give me an uplift. Like yeah, something to look forward to, something that keeps me going. Because uh, I feel like if I didn't have my family, it'd be like what's the point in living? What what is there? What am I living for? What am I? Why, why, what is my existence? What is what does it mean? And it'd be really a, and it'd be more of an ex, of an existence and, and not and not living. And there's a difference there because we're just existing. You're just stagnant basically in life, just going with the same old, same old every day, day in and day out type thing. But if you're living, you have some type of enjoyment or some type of excitement in your life. That that's the reason for your for your existence. You know what I find amazing is that you also, and maybe talk a little bit about this if you could. You've you've married those two, mm -hmm. right? Like your church is made up of, yeah. your, of your family too, yeah, right? Yeah, basically, I mean, yeah. There's four generations of us that have come through the church or I've been at the church all at one time. It's just what it is. <laughs> it's like God is family. Right. How about influences as far as music? Who are the who are the musicians that you that have influenced you that when you listen to their music um they they get you excited, they pull you in. Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf, Little Walter, Big Mama Thornton, Nina Simone, Ray Charles, James Brown. You know, it's, it's it spans the spectrum. It's a big yeah. list. It's a big list. Big list, but those are some of the top the ones that are up there. And John Lee Hooker too. He's he's one of my big inspirations too. Um, that's where I, I pattern some of my playing and styles off of him. You know. Um, so yeah, it's definitely one. Who would you Who would you sit down and have dinner with? Ooh, that's and talk and talk music. If I have to only choose one. That's a tough one. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's a tough one. I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> Yeah, I'd have to really think about that one. That'd be a tough decision. If I had to just pick one, I'd, I'd, I'd have to break the rules and just throw a party and invite everybody. <laughs> That's right. Talk to all of you. Talk, talk to all of them. I think I remember all the words of this song. It's called uh, Missing You. I wrote it when I was locked up in jail. Me and Aaron were together at the time, and, and I was kind of missing the, the little fella. But, uh, yeah. Guitar and I have no idea what nope. goes on in jail. You're allowed a guitar? No. So you just wrote the lyrics and then wrote the lyrics and had put the, it had the, had the music in my head. And then when you got out, picked up a guitar and yep. through the heard it for the first time yourself. Right. Wow. Does being in jail make you though not want to go back? 
Yeah. You don't want to be told when to eat, when to sleep, when to, when to take a shower, and everything else like that. You know, your, your life is ruled by, by, by the clock. It's, a, it's not a good place to be, but it can be a good place to be. And I say that because you run into all kinds of people when you're in there that can teach you some things about, about life. You know, and some and, and show you some of the errors of your ways, whether you realize that they're errors or not, because they share their story with you. And you say, "Wait a minute, that sounds about like like me," you know. And but they talk about how, all the heck the heck they went through in that situation, and you're like, "Okay, I'm 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 not gonna do I'm not going through all that." And so that can help you change your mind, help you change your ways as well. You spend a lot of time in your cell, so you got a lot of time to reflect. Yeah. You said you don't want to, you wouldn't want to go back, but you did. Yeah, I did. How did? How how is that? How did I go back? No, I mean, how did you get? <laughs> you 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 leave. Let's say you're in jail the first time, and you say, I don't want to do that again. Right. But then you find yourself there again. Well, you find yourself there. Like in my situation, I was on a um, uh, DOC, and which is the Department of Corrections. I was underneath their rule because I had I got into some trouble and. It, and still, instead, in lieu of going to prison, they put me on this program where I'd have to check in for a whole year and this, that, and other. But I wasn't checking in like I was supposed to check in. So that's how I kept going back at time after time. So you were in violation of parole. Right. So it took me six, maybe seven years to do one year. But there, there are some guys that I've talked to when I was in there that, that it was like their 59th violation. And they've been, they've been on the run for 12 years. And so they finally, and they're still working on that same one year. But here it is 12 years later, and they're still not done with it. That seems so. Basically, a, a warrant gets issued, right? And so, anytime you cross the law, they check you and they yeah. go, "Oh, wait, man, you got a warrant. We got to right. take you in." You're right, and, and you're it, back in jail. You're right, and it's not a warrant that they can just say, can just say, "Okay, go take care of it later." You know, because it's a felony. Felonies, there's something that they have to, you have to. It's, it's immediate. Go to jail. Do not pass go. Do not collect ten dollars. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it seems like, like. If, you're, if the idea is to rehabilitate and really get people to move on in society, that relationship where people are failing parole all the time and getting sent back in with ever-increasing numbers of warrants seems messed up. Right? Right. I mean, it sounds like from what you're saying, is you run into a lot of people who are back in jail not because they committed another crime, but because they violated their parole. Right. It's, and this whole system seems like a setup for failure. Because they know, especially with, with those who are, who are addicts and stuff like that, they know goodness well that, that their habit is going to come first before, before they're thinking about going to jail. You know, or think about trying to check in because it's going to take a urine test, you know, so they're like, okay, well, forget that noise so no one get locked up. So they're going to keep running as fast and hard as they can. So, yeah, I believe it's a waste of taxpayers' money to lock up folks. I think the money should be spent on rehabilitation. That's why I think people should be sentenced to rehab clinic instead of to jail. The jail isn't rehab because you can get just as high in jail as you can on the streets. Instead of putting them in jail, because like I said, jail isn't going to do nothing, it really. It, it might, it's, it's more of a slap on the wrist than anything. But I think if you honestly are going to help somebody, get them rehabilitated, give them housing, or show them how to get housing, you know, make them go through classes or whatever you have to do, but let the end result be something positive. Because right now the end result is something negative, in my opinion, which is jail. Preacher is a man that cares greatly about how he presents himself to the world, both in appearance and by his word. He's one of the sharpest dressed individuals I honestly have ever met. To see him come out of a tent with the dusty ground and brambling blackberry bushes everywhere, wearing a light blue three-piece suit with matching shoes and fedora, and guitar in hand, is quite the scene. In fact, it makes me smile just sharing it with you. Preacher also always carries with him a diary, a place for his thoughts, new song lyrics, or new poems. I remember one time visiting when they were living down uh, along the railroad tracks in the Inner Bay neighborhood. And as I was leaving, Preacher yelled out, Hey, wait, I need to read you this poem. I remember how much it moved me, watching him stand there, hearing his beauty in the midst of an industrial backyard that was his home. Uh, let's see. This one is called uh, Mother's Joy. And it says, I am my mother's only boy. When I was young, I made her proud and brought her much joy. As I grew, I knew what I, what I was supposed to do. I preached and I preached and prayed. In the church, I'd always, I'd always played. 
Nobody, including me, ever dreamed I stray. Like the prodigal son, one day I decided I was grown and left home. They say the well swallowed Jonah on the deep blue sea. I felt like that same old well had swallowed me. As I wandered and roamed from place to place, door to door, corner to corner, I felt like I belonged in this worldly space. Drinking, gambling, and let's not forget drugging all night long, I was living in a fool's paradise. It's truly an awesome wonder I ain't dead. Over time, living the life I lived created a hole where the money goes. Yes, sadly, that is because of the life I chose. Climbing walls while sitting in a chair just, just to lock my heart like an icy frigidaire. Why? Why not? I keep my feelings there. It's a shame. Every time I try to ease the pain and loose the chains of stress and strain on my troubled brain, it was like a thousand railroad trains racing down the track toward my heart, through my vein, and whoo, Lord, around my brain. Bye-bye happiness, fortune, fame, life, love, family. Damn, I don't know how much more I can stand to lose. Well, they say the well swallowed Jonah, that's why I have these blues. If for no other reason than the fact life gives from the way we live because life is lived through the choices we make. More times than often, we make mistakes like the hole where the money goes and the life of hell I chose. Losing sight, of the, losing sight of the things I was taught as a boy and forgetting I am my mother's joy, I've learned we are like children painting on canvases, picking up shades as we grow. We start off blank with great enthusiasm. Our paint, the color that makes us who we are, brushed on by people we know. If you or I had a choice of colors, would you take some gray with your blue? Choose wisely and watch your technique as you go, because life can be gone in a few. Knowing what I know now, having seen, having seen and felt the depth of pain and misery life, storm, life storms can bring, there's only, one left, there's only one thing left to do, straighten up and fly right. Let down my resistance, stop the fight. That's right, I'm tired of fattening frogs for snakes. That's it, I quit, I'm moving on. Tell them all I'm going home. No more out in this cold, lonely world shall I roam. Back to the place where I'll be safe and warm. Plenty of good food to eat. No longer do I or ever really need it to beg, borrow, steal for a place to sleep. No more acting out. I'm going back not only because I'm my mama's only boy, but I know it'll bring my mother joy. I have not come here to testify about bad misfortune and I ain't wondering why it's not my cross not my cross to bear alone oh not to bear alone you say you got Troubles all in your home Sometimes you can't help but To all weep and moan Have you gone down on your knees and prayer? Left your burdens there It's not your cross to bear alone When you reach out to just say hello to a stranger, that might be all it is. Or perhaps you'll find a new friendship, one that will enrich your life. I'm so very grateful that Preacher has shared his slice of the map of humanity with all of you. If you want to hear more of Preacher's music, please visit Artist Spotlight on the You Know Me Now webpage. If you're moved to do so, you can support Preacher with a one-time or recurring donation directly to his Venmo account, which is listed there. For those of you that have yet to hear about Artist Spotlight and might be asking, what is it? Tomas and I are producing shorter video-based episodes that feature Seattle-area street musicians, buskers, artists, poets, and creative folks who live or have lived on our streets. We want to put a spotlight on their creativity and talent to help bring attention to their gifts and contributions to the rich tapestry of our community. We also hope that it'll provide an opportunity of support for those artists. There's nothing I can do 
Just trust in Jesus, He will see us through. Cause it's not a cross you bear alone. Oh, not you bear alone. Cause it's not a cross you bear alone. You Know Me Now is produced written and edited by Tomas Bernatsky and me, Rex Holbein. We would like to give a heartfelt thanks to our good friend, Preacher, for taking the time to speak with us and share his beautiful life thoughts. You Know Me Now has a Facebook and Instagram page where you can join in on the conversation. We also have a website at youknowmenow.com where you can see photos of Preacher. We also have stories there of other folks we feel you should get to know. Thanks as always for listening.